If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Wendy, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 236 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Welcome back for what's sure to be a classic conversation for the ages. This one's going down without a spoonful of sugar. This one's going down easy. We're here with Jeffrey C. Sherman, director of The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story. You know all about The Sherman Brothers. We discussed it in my conversation with Wendy Liebman. Wendy and Jeff happen to be married. The Sherman Brothers are responsible for all the songs you love from the original Parent Trap, Mary Poppins, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Charlotte's Web, The Jungle Book, The Aristocats, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. This was Jeff's dad and uncle, the Sherman Brothers. He did an amazing documentary on them. We're going to talk all about it. It's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, I do want to remind everyone of my amazing conversation with Kathy Garver, sissy of Family Affair. We had an amazing conversation. Dove right into her memoir, Surviving Sissy. You got to listen to that one. It's an amazing, amazing conversation. But right now, we've got amazingness waiting for you right here. My conversation with Jeffrey Sherman. We're talking Sherman Brothers. We're talking about his time on Boy Meets World, helping Wendy Liebman create her hour-long special, Taller on TV. So many great stories coming right at you right now. All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to my guest today, writer, producer, director, songwriter, husband of Wendy Liebman. You loved his work with Au Pair, Au Pair de, and Au Pair Toi. I learned French so I could do that properly because <laughs> Au Pair is French. Director of The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story. Welcome to my show, Jeffrey C. Sherman. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Hey, Jeff, glad to have you here. <laughs> I see why you have the C there, because there's other Jeff Shermans. It's the funniest thing when I do podcasts, usually they don't ask me and they'll go to my Wikipedia page. And I sort of share, I'm sort of merged with this other Jeff Sherman who was in a, a, a band called Glass or something. So people usually start now, you're in this band for years and I, I have to start them over again. So. Oh, were you not in a band with Sean Cassidy? I was in a band with Sean Cassidy. Yes. <laughs> so I guess I got it right. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a long time ago. We uh, I had a garage band with a buddy from across the alley, a fellow named Jeff Levy. And Jeff now is a, a big director and producer writer, married to the woman who invented the juicy couture, so he's doing fine. But at the end of the day, he had, he was a drummer and which was hard to find. He knew a guy named Sean who was in his class, they were a year or two behind me. So we all got together and so it was Sean Cassidy, Jeff Levy. Jamie Lee Curtis was in the band for a couple of the times. We, we practiced another fellow named uh, Phil Morris, who is a, a huge voiceover talent. He was on uh, Seinfeld. Uh, he's done a lot of work. His dad was Greg from uh, Mission Impossible, one of the core guys there. That was my garage band. So, all right. Yeah, no, I know Phil, uh, Phil Morris. The uh, He was the uh, the lawyer, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> on Seinfeld. Yeah, Jackie Childs, I think his name was. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sort of Johnny Cochran. How long did that band, was it your dream? For those days, it was a long one. I think we lasted about two weeks, but I, I, we lasted long enough. We were, we were in a battle of the bands and we were driven to it by Shirley Jones during the Partridge Family era in her station wagon. So I kind of felt like I was part of the Partridge Family. Is that, you know, but the dream was over after about two or three weeks. It wasn't like a long. All right. All right. Well, okay, that's, isn't that Sean Cassidy's mom? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So that's awesome. So it makes sense that you would then grow up and marry a super famous comedian. You've just been around famous people your whole life. Your wife is one of my favorite people ever. Oh, thank you. Mine too. She's right up there. No, I'm, she's my favorite. <laughs> when I was uh, interviewing Wendy, who I, I probably stalked for, I don't know, a good year or so, maybe she finally answered because she, she saw my name, thought it was you for a second, you know? <laughs> 
But she said that, now I told her, I think she's one of the funniest people in the world. And she said that she thought you were, were the one of the funniest people in the world that no one makes her laugh like you. So that's that's high compliment. Yeah, usually she says it this way. She'll say nobody makes me laugh more than my husband husband does in bed. That's what she <laughs> says on stage. So which is about the only true joke in her in her whole uh, thing. So we're perfectly suited for one another cuz I'm an introvert. She's an I don't know if she's an extrovert, but she loves going up on stage. She, she has no problem with that. I would just die. I could never do that kind of a thing. You make the magic behind the camera. Well, it's, that's debatable too. But <laughs> <laughs> some things I'm very proud of. Some of my early works were a little sketchy, but uh... yeah, well, <laughs> we'll cover it all. We'll do, we'll get to it. It was funny because I learned about the Sherman brothers or because of just randomly bringing up something to Wendy. Right. So, I, so I like, was, Oh, your husband, his dad wrote the, the Mary Poppins songs. Right. And, and she's like, Oh yeah, well there's the Sherman brothers. And she started to explain the, the deeper rabbit hole that I had just barely scratched the surface of there. She then shared the story of how you inspired the song spoonful of sugar. Yeah, accidentally. I really didn't. I didn't say, Hey dad, here's a great idea for a song. I, I stood in line with everybody else in my class and got the polio vaccine, which was an oral vaccine, and they were stuck on a song. So I, I came home and told them this. I was famous or infamous for, as a child, I was a big kid, and I used to, I don't know if you're old enough, but they used to bring in these trays of booster shots, and they would give them to you one after another in the, in the kid's doctor's office. And I was infamous for knocking the tray over and running and hiding in Beverly Hills so they couldn't find me. So that day I got this polio vaccine, told my dad, and he was just amazed. And it kind of sparked something for him. So that's where that, that idea for that song came from. I found something on your, I think it was either Twitter or Facebook, where you posted a, a picture from the Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> well, this trivia that we're talking about right now, they felt matched perfectly with the fact that Taylor Swift had 10 <laughs> singles at the same time, top 10, all Taylor Swift, and the cat that Marlon Brando was petting at the beginning of the Godfather was just an accidental thing. They found a stray. The third thing on that page, <laughs> Jeff Sherman, <laughs> inspiring <laughs> Robert Bowtie. Sherman about Spoonful of Sugar. <laughs> the funny thing with that, it's amazing to me, and I've learned in doing the documentary in other ways, really kind of beyond just knowing my dad or even kind of knowing him on a surface level of, you know, my dad's this famous songwriter, but then really seeing the effect worldwide okay. has been amazing. So when the COVID crisis started, I was watching a lot of the news like everybody else was, you know, stocking up with tuna fish and watching, you know, CNN and MSNBC. And I saw uh, Dr. Gupta on TV, Sanjay Gupta, talking about even when they get this vaccine, he said there were things being developed, but even when they got it, they were afraid that people weren't going to readily get a vaccine because there was all this anti-vax thought in, in the country. And he was worried about that. So... I remembered that story that I'd gotten this oral vaccine and I thought, oh, you know, this is just a little thing. And I put it on Facebook. I just, I told the story of, you know, getting the thing in school and coming home, my dad came up with a song and I said, we need to trust the doctors and scientists. And and uh, when it, it comes time and then we can get all, I'll get through this. Well, suddenly I was getting all these hits on Facebook about it. People were sending it to other people. And Wendy said, you know, you should do it on, put it on Twitter. And I've never done Twitter. It's like, I'm way too, I'd be probably already figured this out in two of a post to ever, you know, put anything on a post, post stamp. But I broke it into like two tweets and suddenly my phone started vibrating on my desk and the thing went super viral and it's been seen about 13 million times and it, it got all this attention all over. and then ironically the person who kind of inspired me to do this i was uh, interviewed on sanjay gupta by sanjay gupta's uh, associate on his podcast and that was really cool i mean it's just it's really because you know partly because it was this worldwide thing and everybody was looking for something cheerful during the pandemic i think but it is a testament to how much that music and the songs meant to people and just the genius of my dad and uncle, which I've always been just amazed by. When I was talking to Wendy and she starts telling me, I'm like, wait a minute, those guys from Saving Mr. Banks, that's your <laughs> husband father? Because I, I, you know, I saw that movie and I remember that. I'm like, BJ Novak? He's like, oh yeah, yeah BJ Novak was uh, my husband's father in the, in the movie. Yeah, I met my dad, who's probably, I don't know, 20 years younger than I am. It was pretty into the premiere. That was kind of interesting. My cousin and I, who made the documentary, The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story, we recently uh, teamed up with the former head of music at Disney, Mitchell Lieb, and we started a little company to put on a couple of my dad and uncle's plays that haven't been done before and maybe adapted 
a movie into a stage play and some concerts and things like that. So it's really great. And the reception is wonderful. I mean, people are really hungry for that, that music. It's timeless and wonderful and makes everybody happy. Are these plays that you're talking about unheard Sherman Brothers music? For the most part, yes. Or they, they were things that almost got there, the things that they really wanted to do. And, and I, you know, having grown up, I was old enough and also in the business at the same time as my dad and actually got to work with them on, on one of the first Disney Channel shows and got to kind of learn at his and my uncle's feet uh, how to do that sort of thing. I forgot your question. That's the age I'm at now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you answered the question. So, and then you started talking about the Enchanted Musical Playhouse. Oh yeah, that, that was fun. I went to the opening. There was a grand opening when Disney Studios used to have a back lot where they used to shoot all the TV shows. They have like the Western Street and the the neighborhood street and that kind of stuff. And so they had this big party to launch the Disney Channel and my dad had me come with him. And I'm out of film school because I'd gone to UCLA film school and I'd, I'd done a few things, a couple movies and had this idea to do a kid's musical series called, you know, uh, taking classic uh, kid's stories and making them into half hour musicals with my dad and uncle. So I asked my dad who the head of the Disney Channel was. And just before he made a speech, I walked over to him and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm the son of one of the Sherman brothers. He goes, oh, nice to meet you. And I said, yeah, I would love to come in and pitch a series to you. He said, well, set it up here. Go talk to her. As I talked to her and she set up the meeting with me and I went in and the meeting was going fine. And then they said, well, it's it's great, but you know, we're just starting up. And I said, and I'll bring in the Sherman brothers to write the songs. They sat up like, really? Because they hadn't worked there in ages. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, what's that going to cost? And I had never talked to my dad about what he made. It was like, kind of seemed gauche to me to ask him what he made it. So I'm thinking, you know, by my standards, it seems I've never been good at gauging these kind of things. And I said, well, it's going to be, you know, $5,000 a song. And they like threw contracts in front of me. And I go home, I call my dad because we have cell phones. And I said, dad, great news. I'm going to get to work with you. And do it. Great. And you guys are going to work with me. And you're going to write the songs. I'm going to write the scripts. I'll, I'll produce it. And wonderful. He goes, how much are we getting? And I said, dad, I got you $5,000 a song. There was this long silence. And he said, Jeff. Way back in, I think, 1951, I got $5,000 for a song. It's okay, we'll do it. It'd be fun to work with you. And they did, and we got to do it, and we worked with the Osmond family, mostly uh, Jimmy Osmond and Donnie Osmond were my partners on it. That's cool. So was it, was it awesome getting your dad and uncle to work together? I'll tell you a story I don't often tell. It goes into what I learned and why I was interested in doing the documentary about them. So I always kind of knew their stuff, and I I knew they'd had some tensions and they that's putting it mildly. So when I got this, I said to my dad, what do I do? How do I work with you? He said, we'll get three copies of the same book. The first one we were doing was The Velveteen Rabbit. Marie Osmond already said she would play it no matter what we came up with. So that was cool. And he said, and drop one at your uncle's house. Now, my uncle lived seven blocks from me and I didn't know where he lived because we didn't socialize with them. So he said, yeah, he told me. He said, basically down seven blocks and go right. So I, I go. And my uncle, who I knew from the office pretty well, our family's in socialist. So he opens the door a crack and he takes the book through the crack. It was kind of creepy. And he took the book through the crack and said, thank you, closed it. No, okay, that's a little weird. And I, and I went, dropped one for my dad and I mark up the book and I walk, I'm like, all excited. My dad and uncle had this office that used to be where Marilyn Monroe took music lessons. I always thought it was haunted. It's now where the Larry Flint building is in, uh, on Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> they tore it down. But so I go up the steps and I walk in and it's just so tense there. You could smell tension. My dad's sitting at his desk and my uncle's sitting at his desk across the room. And they're just staring. And I walk in, nobody says anything. And there's a chair in the middle of the, of the room. So I sit in the chair kind of awkwardly. And I said, so um, how are you guys doing? My dad said, let's just jump into it. And I went, okay. And I'm thinking, oh, my uncle's pissed about $5,000 or something. How? I don't know what I did, but it's not that at all. So I start talking and, and nobody said anything. So I said, Dad, I think the first song ought to, first song ought to come on page three where this happens with the Velveteen Rap. My uncle goes, that's the stupidest, putting your own word there, a thing I ever heard. And my dad gets furious and he hits his desk and he stands up and he walks to the middle of the room where I am and he goes, Dick, you talk to me like that. You cannot talk to my son like that. And they're both on one side of me. And he goes, if, if he's going to work with us, he's going to work with us the way we work with us. And they go back and forth. And finally, Michael gets this idea, walks over to the piano that they always had in their office. And he starts playing this happy little melody. And my dad shakes his head, walks back to his desk, flips his pad open. They start writing a song in front of me called Ribbity Rabbity Run. It's this little kid's song. And I look at them both and I go, oh, this is going to be a long process, right? 
So I get home, I call my dad and I said, dad, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what I brought out there. And he goes, oh, Jeff, we always work out. So it was kind of, it fascinated me. And that led me into, you know, wanting to know more about it and really wanting to know my the other side of my family because we were strangers, even though we live seven blocks away from each other. You know, a little dysfunction in the family. I thought that was extremely interesting that you, you know, dove into into that in the in the documentary. So one, you got to connect with your cousin, right? That you had Gregory. So did you really know him before or did you kind of go to him and kind of almost introduce yourself to him as well? Well the way it worked out was we knew each other. I mean I knew who he was, but it was like there was this invisible wall. I can't really describe it. It was like a force field. I saw my uncle all the time. We would be friendly. But after about, after Mary Poppins around 1965, something happened. We all knew it, but nobody knew what. Sorry to interrupt and create this cliffhanger, but we have to take a quick break. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to Jeff's captivating story and how he finally connected with Greg and went on to co-direct the boys. And we're back. So comes around, my mom has recently passed away at this point, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the stage version, is opening in London. So my dad says, you want to come out for the opening? I said, I'd love to. So I, I fly out just by myself. And it's at, at this uh, Palladium Theater, which is a beautiful, huge, old historic theater in London. And as I'm walking in, I see my cousin behind me. But we kind of go like, you know, I we always did. I never talked to him. I never talked to Greg that I can think of for this. And we go in and they seat us on one side of a balcony and they seat my uncle's family on the other side near Andrew Lloyd Webber. And we're on the other side near Allie, Barry, and the guy that was playing James Bond. So that was what it was because the Brockens were going to do all the James Bond movies. Anyway, so after the thing, I'm just there and they have this beautiful party at the in and out Club in London, which I don't know if it's still there, but it was a really cool place. And the Broccoli's just put on the most amazing parties. You can imagine just like a fantasy land, the Alice in Wonderland party. And I'm wandering around and my dad's tired and he goes to bed. And, and so I'm just kind of at this party and there are a lot of people still on. And I see my cousin doing jello shots at the bar. And I said, what the hell? And I walked up and I put my hand on his shoulder and said, so what the hell happened to our families? What do you think? And he turns around and he goes, I am so glad you came over. I've always wanted to talk to you. And we ended up talking for about three hours and we've stayed friendly ever since. And he was approached to do by somebody who supposedly had $100 million in Chinese money. No one ever has $100 million in Chinese money, by the way, that wanted to do a thing about the Sherman Brothers. And he asked me to help him with that. And that evolved into working with, with him and with Ben Stiller and his company and Steve Buxbaum and, and other people that we worked with on the documentary. But it, it really was wonderful because it's opened up this whole other side of the family and we've become super close. It's, it's the best reward of all of it. And that my dad... And uncle got to see in their time that they were still pretty, they were kind of forgotten. And I'm not at all tooting my own horn, this is their deal, but that we put it up there for people to see in the boys, the Sherman Brothers story. Um, they got the Medal of Arts at the White House. They got a lot of their projects got a little more heat and people really cared about them more. So um, that was a wonderful thing. My dad got to see that a couple of years before he died and, and uh, got to see his, his father's story told a little bit too. So that was, you know, the greatest reward on that one for me. I love that. That was that was really cool. There's a lot of um, people behind the scenes that people don't realize that, oh, they love something and they don't know that. Like, and in, in, I remember in Motown, I think it was the Funk Brothers. And there was like, they did a thing on the Funk Brothers. And I was like, these are the guys that made every sound you love. <laughs> you never heard of them. Like, that's what I was saying. Like, when I was talking to Wendy, I was like, oh, those guys, right? I was like, and then, and then when I watched the documentary, I've been telling everyone, I go, oh, you got to watch this documentary. It's just it's oh, incredible. You. It's a great documentary but it also is one of those kind of things that you watch and it hits you different just because you can relate to it you know with the music and you start to understand oh these things that meant something to me and mean something to me this is where it came from and it's it's a really it's really interesting it was interesting for me too just to see it all together i grew up i'd hear the stuff before anybody my dad would come home with the with the acetate the demos they would make and stuff and tapes and things and he'd play them for me and my sisters at night just before we'd have dinner and so i'd hear them kind of develop and go so i'd hear the early my uncle singing my with my dad singing the choruses with him of the pop and songs all the way through the orchestration 
So, you know, each iteration of that, I would get to see. So I really learned the business that way, how it really evolves. And, and which is great for me because, you know, my family, you've seen the documentary, my grandfather was a Tin Pan Alley songwriter. And before him, his father was a famous violinist in, in uh, Ukraine and then in uh, Czechoslovakia. And he was the a concert master and came to the United States. And because it was the jazz age and he was a classical violinist, he had to work playing violin table to table at an Italian restaurant in Brooklyn and was depressed and poor. So I, all these different generations of music in the family have kind of come down. And now even Wendy's very musical. And I think she told me she was on, she was Eliza Doolittle and My Fair Lady, she has a beautiful voice and she plays piano, which was I already loved her. When she did that, I like grabbed her and said, no, we're going to get married because that's just wonderful. And now my kids are both really, I have two sons, my own Sherman brothers, and my, my cousin Greg has Sherman brothers too, who are both musical. One of the kids works at Google and is also an amazing composer. And the other one is just singer, songwriter, wonderful, and maybe a grandpa. So things are good. <laughs> that is good. Yeah. And I, I've just really, you know, been exposed to it all my life. So now I'm doing my own little, I've been putting out some albums of my own too, just for ever since COVID started, I just, it was a kind of a hobby that grew into a, a an obsession or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, it's good that you have, uh, and Greg have their own Sherman because you and Greg would be the Sherman cousins, which doesn't really have the same ring to it. But the funny thing is we did so much, you know, so many things. We did the whole circuit when the movie came out because it was a Disney release. We were in like, I don't know, 50 or 60 film festivals. So we do all this junkets and stuff. And they would always, they would always say, now you guys are brothers, right? Everybody always thinks, of them. we've kind of stopped. The game we would play, though, is everybody, the question that always was asked was, do you have a favorite Sherman Brothers song? So we do each have one. Uh, I have probably two. But we made an agreement that we would always say, we would just choose a random song every time. So if you look back at our interviews, it's always a different song, you know, because it's hard to kind of pick them. And they had a lot of good songs. Yeah, there was, there's a lot. I got other questions on that. The documentary does it. You mentioned your grandfather, Al Sherman. So it, it talks about him and he was he was famous in his day. He had he's known for a bunch of songs as well. I'm going to list these, but I'm not going to pretend like I know them. <laughs> <laughs> well, off the top of my head, yes. off the top of my head, you got to be a football hero and potatoes are cheaper. Right. <laughs> But I did read, interestingly enough, He's So Unusual was covered by Cindy Lauper. She tweaked it a bit. That was an interesting uh, bit of trivia. Yeah, I was in college. My, my dad calls me up because he would get my grandfather's royalty checks, which had, at that point, they'd kind of gone down to in the hundreds of dollars. And suddenly it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like there were, I don't really know because, again, I didn't talk to him, but he, he said, it's crazy. And he said, and he called me at college and he said, it was a Berkeley at the time. He said, so Jeff, do you know this artist named Cindy Lau Lauper? And I said, why? He goes, he said, she covered Grandpa Al's song. And I said, wait, Cindy Lauper? And I, I have the album. I didn't even put it together. It was He's So Unusual. And, and her, her album was called She's So Unusual, her first album. So that Grandpa crossed generations too. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> it's a, oh no, cash the check before someone make, realizes it's a mistake, right? <laughs> before you realize. My wife watched the documentary with me and she's uh, wanted me to tell you this. Her great great uncle was Jay Gorney. Jay Gorney wrote Brother Can You Spare a Dime? Oh, wow. Yeah. Great song. He also had a writing partner who then stole his wife and that didn't end well. But was that Tim Penn Alley? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet my grandfather knew him. He, my grandfather wrote this book that was never published, but I just read it again. And it's, it's fascinating to be an adult now because I always thought of my grandfather as this very soft, easygoing guy. And he was like Sammy Glick. I mean, he was he would see a, an artist in an elevator, grab the elevator, go in. And he was just principally a composer, so he worked with a lot of different lyricists. And there's this whole book about it. It's wonderful. It's called Potatoes Are Cheap. Oh, all right. We'll have to check out. Maybe uh, maybe your relative and my wife's is in that. Your grandpa and my be, wife's. Yeah. What was his name again? Jay uh, Gorney. Okay. I'll look him up. Yeah, he also, I guess, is credited with bringing Shirley Temple to 20th Century Fox. Wow. Yeah. Pretty, uh, we both can't, we both have such a history. <laughs> <laughs> Some music royalty there is. <laughs> and uh, just the other day, she got a royalty check for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands. Okay, so your grandpa Al moves to California, as the story goes, and then uh, has the Sherman brothers. <laughs> My grandfather was not that famous for it, but put together some famous teams. He worked at a place called uh, Remick Music, which was, at the time, people, they didn't have a lot of ways to 
convey music. Some people would go to this place and you'd go in these little music rooms and a guy on a piano would play sheet music for you. If you liked it, you would bring it home and someone could play it in your parlor. It was called parlor music. So my grandfather worked there as one of the, the demonstrators. And in the next room was a guy named George. And George was you know, a really nice guy. They would go to lunch all the time. They hung out with each other's families. And George started writing songs. And he said, you know, Al, you should start writing. So what was George Gershwin? And so, so George is wedding with different people. So my grandfather knew the whole family, and he met Ira, his brother. And Ira was working, I think, as an accountant or something. He had another gig. But he really wanted to write lyrics, and he really wanted to write them with George. George was a big star at this point. So he said to my grandpa, Al, this is his book. He said, you know, I don't know what to say to him. And Al said, leave it to me. And he took George, and he said, George, come with me to lunch. He goes, why? He goes, I'm going to introduce you to your next writing partner. And he had Ira sitting in the diner nearby, and he sat him down, and that's how that started. And I don't know how much of that's legend or how much is real, but that's what he tells us. And I heard that from my dad. And my grandfather wasn't really like a boasty guy. It was kind of like to him, it was like natural. But then he, he saw my dad and uncle, as we show in the documentary. And my dad's this, this English major and, and writing books. And my uncle wants to write symphonic music, and they're both starving, and he's supporting them. So he challenged them to write a pop song that kids would spend their lunch money on. And they wrote a bunch of songs. And finally, after about, I don't know, 15 or 16 songs, they wrote a song called Gold Can Buy Anything But Love. And they went, at the time, the New York music business had moved to Vine Street in Hollywood because all the stars had come out there. All the music publishers were there. So my dad and uncle went and found a publisher who liked it and started their career. That song kind of blew up. And that's how he kind of challenged them into becoming guys that ended up writing a thousand published songs and 50 movie soundtracks. Just amazing. All the, half the songs at Disneyland, you name it. It's amazing. It goes on and on. In the, in the documentary, is it maybe Al that dies, your grandpa dies, or grandma, and then there's two Shivas? Yeah. So I found this part of the story interesting, not just because it was like, oh, that's the drama, the story, and the conflict, and all that. Is it in my own person? I mean, I'm sure everyone, a lot of people can relate to it in, in their own way, but you know, I grew up not talking to my cousins for many, many years. And then at one point, like you, we reconnected and, and then became very close. And there is family that at some point my parents decided we weren't talking to them. And my brother, the happens, Jewish curse. <laughs> yeah, my brother happens to be good friends with him, but it's a coincidence that we're just cousins, right? It has nothing to do with that. You know, that part of it is like, I was just interested, like your father, your grandfather had like such a, a role in connecting them and giving them that challenge, which kind of led to snowballed into their working together and becoming the Sherman brothers. Did they not hold the family together? Did they not have any, like, I, I'm guessing not, but like, did they not have any like traditions where, you know, Passover or the fam, ball the family over? Like there was nothing where that centered around them? I can kind of give you, it's a multi-step story, but when my, when my family had to leave Ukraine, they were from a place called Ekaterinoslav, which was which no longer exists, but they were killing all the Jews there. So they had to come through Hungary and Czechoslovakia. And one of the places they stayed while they were waiting to reunite family in Europe before they came to America, they stayed with a rabbi. And the rabbi came, my grandfather Al was the oldest uh, boy in the family. And so he wanted to show him that God was magic. And he held, he told Al to close his eyes, hold his hand over him. And he said, if you believe in God, he'll give you a reward. And my grandfather peeked and saw him drop the candy and then never believed in God after that, partly because he thought being Jewish meant that you had to leave your home and you, he wanted to kill you. So he was always Jewish, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't not like George Santos. They observed it, but I didn't know any of this as a kid. And then they came and then my dad was an American GI. He enlisted at 17, going to this a bit in the documentary too. And he hadn't been raised that Jewish. He'd had a bar mitzvah. His only guest of bar mitzvah was Sam Goldwyn Jr. I mean, that was, he grew up in Beverly Hills too, after coming to LA. So he goes and, and he's landing at Normandy and, and he fights his way through Europe. And one of the last places he went was he was the first American GI to liberate Dachau concentration camp. And when he figured out, because they were trying to communicate with him, they started speaking Yiddish and he recognized it. He was the only Jew in his little battalion that came in. And he looked and they could tell he was Jewish and it freaked him out. And he, again, these nightmares kind of stayed with him and really gave him problems through his life. So that always equated with him. So he, he didn't really believe in, in there could be a God if that existed. And so my uncle also just never was 
raised that religiously. I have jokes I could say about it, but I won't because I love my uncle. He's Jewish in a sense, too. My mom was raised pretty strictly Jewish. I had a bar mitzvah, and I, you know, she was the influence on that. But that was never really a basis for them. So it really came down to this. When we were doing our interviews, Haley Mills, of all people, said the most amazing thing. You know, she said, so they didn't, she was sort of surprised she wanted to know. She said they didn't get along. She said, well, it's not surprising if you think about it. They needed time away from each other to be creative in the time they had together. They needed that space alone. So maybe they just repelled and did that. And there was another guy who told us, unless you're different enough, and they were such different guys, and really growing up with them, my dad was so different. I mean, just people, even there, at, my dad lost his New York accent intentionally when he came to, my uncle still has the New York accent. I mean, it was like, they kind of looked alike and they stopped looking alike. Just different personality. But if you don't have that friction of those two personalities, you might as well write alone. They call it stereoptics. They look at the world slightly differently. My dad had these firsthand experiences in, in the worst parts of World War II. I mean, just the, I can't even describe them. He's, he described them to me a few times. My uncle, you know, was stationed conducting a band at Fort Ord, California in his service. So that's kind of how they just went different ways. But that magic of the two really bipolar personalities really makes those magical things happen. Yeah, it was interesting, the, the, whole, the whole friction of it, but the whole liberating Dachau thing. And I mean, that's got to change you. I don't, how, how do you ever see those things firsthand? He had those, those horrible nightmares you, you see on, in movies and stuff. I have a much younger brother. He didn't really grow up with that part of our lives. But my, my two sisters and I would hear it screaming in the middle of the night. And we thought our parents were having a fight. We'd look in, it was just my dad flailing on the bed. I mean, it was, it was horrible. One little side interesting story about him is also a painter, painted all the time. It was one of his main things he loved to do, his passions. And he went through this, these different periods, sort of like Picasso or whoever, but he went through his dark period where he was painting just concentration camp paintings. And he did about four or five canvases. I used to come in and watch him sometimes. And he was in a dark place. And we had a fire pit in the backyard. I was walking and I look out the window and I see black smoke spewing from the backyard. I think, what's going on here? Were we having a fight? They come out, my dad's throwing the canvases, the concentration canvases on the fire. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, I, I got him out of me and I never want to look at him again. He was a very deep guy. Very deep. Oh my, wow. Which gives context to their song. I mean, that's what, I didn't want to do like a mommy dearest story about our, because, it, you know, there's, it's not like you said, it's in your family too. It's not unusual, especially in, in Jewish families to have these, you know, I'm ripping my shirt, you're dead to me kind of arguments, especially when they're in business together. But they miraculously created these, you know, wonderful things. So that's what we really wanted to celebrate. The, our theme for it was brothers, partners, strangers. But the real miracle of them was that they worked together their whole lives, really. And when they worked, they ascended from this friction place to this wonderful place. And I, when you were with them and you'd go there, it was, it was like, Sitting near the violins in a, in a big symphony, a big symphony, they kind of lifted you up. Watching them just kind of get to this little, they became little boys again, which is part of the reason I called Greg and I called it boys. Then because Walt Disney called them, but they were they were like little boys. They argued like little boys and they played like. Little. Were you there at all when they were working on Mary Poppins, or just inspiring from home taking vaccines? No, because most of Poppins they wrote in their office. They didn't really write at each other's house. The real dark secret was our moms hated each other. So there was not a lot of mixing there. That's, we touch on it in the movie, but they just really, God rest my mom and my Aunt Elizabeth, who I'm friendly with, you know, but they just could not connect. They had different wants and needs. Did you ever go to the office and hang with them there? A lot. I, that was how I knew my uncle, really. Offices, um, sound stages, and the recording sessions. Um, I would go to a lot of the recording sessions. Especially after Disney, they got an office right near Beverly Hills High School where I went to school and I'd ride my bike and I, that was my course going home. So I would often just go to their office, bring my bike up and my uncle and dad play the songs that they'd written for like, like this batch of songs. And these are the same songs that ended up in Tom Sawyer and Charlotte's Web and you name it. I mean, just, it, and it was magical. It just made, I think for me, what it did, people always go, oh, that environment. Really what it was for me is it was possible to take these it wasn't really a ridiculous stretch to think you could take what you're thinking. And if it really got in a way to connect with people, that you could actually do something with it. And so I've, especially nowadays, it's like me, you know, I, I really never pursued my music. But nowadays with technology, you know, for $35 on, on an online 
thing I won't name here because they're not, I'm not advertising for them. But you can, I'm sure there are many services like this. If you record your music, you can put it on and it goes all over and people can hear it, share it. And it's my stuff's been on TV shows now. So I didn't even intend for that. I just wanted people to share it with people. I guess just being around it meant you could express yourself. My grandfather, we, he would give me piano lessons on Saturdays. We'd either fly kites or go fishing. And then we'd go back either to his apartment in the Miracle Mile in the Wilshire District, or we'd go back to our house. And I have a picture with him. It's one of my favorite pictures where I'm sitting next to Grandpa at a piano lesson. And he would give me these lessons. And at the end of the lesson, he would say, first he'd play me just off the top of his head. He would just start playing. And he'd say, you'd start thinking about a place or a person or a time and let your fingers kind of find it and express it. That's almost like painting. And he would give me these kind of psychological lessons. And then he would play me a medley of his skits. And the wonderful thing was he still had his thick Russian accent. So you'd hear these American standards like football hero. And he'd sing, you got to be a football hero. You know, and he would write those kind of things. But that was wonderful. And then I learned so much from my dad. I can't even put it in words. I'm writing a book now and putting some of it in there. And my uncle recently, recently, he's, all, he's almost 95, he's still doing okay, he still plays piano every day, and he's in really good spirits and doing great. But he said, I said, Dick, how did, I know how my dad approached it, but I never really asked you what was your process. And this is one of the most amazing things. And he said, well, you know, your dad and I would talk out the idea. And then he'd go to his corner, I'd go to my corner, we both kind of, he said, in my case, I would take in the world, I'd breathe in the world. Think about that idea and let it come out through my fingers on the keyboard. Not, you know, if you're musical, anybody out there is musical, you'll know what that means. And it, one other thing I'm going to convey, because I just think it's magic to convey these things. When we were interviewing Alan Menken, Alan gave a description, which is what I do every time I sit down and I think of him. And he said, music is like water. It's always running. It's always running. And what we do as artists is we put our fingers in the water and shape it and reshape it, but it's always wrong. And it's a wonderful kind of a place to get in in your head. Kind of, I almost do a meditation before I start, and it takes me away to, like my grandfather says, to places like that. I take in the whole world, and I then I reshape the water. It's, it's where my music comes from. I was going to mention Alan Mankin, because I thought one of the things he said was, it was so interesting that it was subtle, but I, that the way you captured it was when he explained the realization that he was replacing his idols. Yeah. That always happens, right? There's the, the people that are hot and then the new person comes in and, and that person's hot. And you could tell like it was, it, it was just that, that moment of like, oh, like you could tell like he was going to accept the baton, but it also kind of broke his heart. You also know you're next. You're, it's, it's you're walking down a plank, you know, I'm the guy at the end of the plank. Uh oh, there's someone behind me. <laughs> Boom. I had that one time I was, uh, and again, not too many moments because the movie never got made, but I was in a bidding, I wrote a screenplay back in the, in the mid 80s. Suddenly it was scooped up and it was in this bit when all the bidding wars were going on on scripts. I got into one of these. I became this huge client at CAA. Like every, in two weeks, I made like five deals. And it was all, they just kept, go here, go here. And I'm doing all this stuff, right? And I think I'm the big shot. And I go to my agent's office, I go in because I, I, something happened. And he says, hold on a minute. He's on his phone one of the big agents there and he goes yeah 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 can you wait like uh, five minutes i've got the next jeff sherman coming in and i realized that was already done like in two weeks i was it was like so fast and your flavor of the, well, not even the month i was like flavor of like six days and boom over the over the plank but uh it was fun while it lasted at least you had those six days it was fun sorry to interrupt but i have to take a quick break and look for the next jeff sherman and we're back with Jeff Sherman. I didn't abandon him. We're back and we're going to talk all about his albums. All right, so you have four albums, Afterglow, yeah. Respite, Wishing Tree, and Begin Again. And yes. uh, you can get those anywhere. Look up Jeffrey C. Sherman when you're doing it because there's other Jeff Sherman. <laughs> he may be better than I am, so you can check them both out. <laughs> They're mostly piano and symphonic pieces and a few electronic pieces. And and uh, just to kind of give you a, you know, it's good for a, a, a nice walk. I, I listen to them on my watch or if I'm driving or something like that. Nice, non, non-verbal. I don't sing. Anybody who knows my voice will be happy to know that. It's just musical compositions. So you can get those anywhere. I enjoyed, uh, I can't remember which one, um, the Wishing Tree one I looked at because I like the cover. So I look, I picked that well, one. Thank you. I picked that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's a tree that's on my beach. I do a beach walk about once a week. Uh, it's about a 16-mile walk. That's right. I'm getting in the end of the walk. So I always make a little wish on that tree. And I took a picture and put it on the cover. So that one is. It's a very cool photo. Thank you. One of the things you've written songs for is Three Bears Christmas. Yeah. It was funny because when I read that, it reminded me like how many Christmas songs were written by Jewish people. Almost all of them. Chestnuts wrote saying, I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Let It Snow, Santa Baby, Most Wonderful Time of the Year, Silver Bells, White Christmas, Rudolph, The Red-Nosed Reindeer, Rocking Around the Christmas Tree, <laughs> Walking in a Winter Wonderland. Everyone not Jewish right now is going, having a, a moment. <laughs> <laughs> this can't be right. Yeah, my, my dad and uncle wrote a couple. They wrote uh, one that got cut out of The Happiest Millionaire, which is a beautiful song called uh, It Won't Be Long Till Christmas which you can find on YouTube. It's a beautiful song, but it just, they cut it for whatever reason at the time. And Disney was going on. And uh, they wrote Christmas in Los Angeles, which is, I think, still the official Christmas, the Los Angeles Christmas song. It, it won some, something or other that they did. But uh, yeah, and I've written a couple. Yeah, I wrote the, the Three Bears Christmas. A friend of mine called me and he, he Billy Butler, he's a director. He used to be an actor in a bunch of movies. And, and he called me and we'd worked together on a, we were working on, a number of things, including a stage musical about Three Dog Night, the band. He said, hey, you know, I know you write songs. I'm doing this movie. It's a Christmas movie. Can you write something about this and that? And I went, yeah. And so I sat down at the piano and just kind of came to me. Then I went to my office and recorded it. And about two hours later, I sent him like a little quick mix of it. And he goes, great, I'm going to use this in the movie. I said, great, do you want me to? He goes, no, no, I'm going to use this recording. So that's what's in it. Although he, he had an actor sing because, again, it was my voice. But the tracks and my tracks, I just kind of threw together. But he put them in. And then I wrote another song with him. So that was fun. It was, I'm doing a lot more of that now. I'm doing a lot of musicals and worked with um, country singer um, Shelley Wright, if you know Shelley, and Kristen Chenoweth on a musical a couple of years ago, an animated musical. And I wrote another one um, with my son, Alex, and uh, based on a story by my sons, both my sons, Alex and Ryan. So getting into that. Just trying to explore, you know, this, this. I'm 65 now, so I'm kind of at this point in my life where I've taken it in. I've gone, what do I still want to do? You know, what is it that I, well, you know, I'm, I'm at that age where my, my, I told Wendy, we have to start making younger friends because the older ones are all going. Sorry, everybody. But you kind of take stock, you know, I've had relatives and, and close friends pass away. So writers that I was on staff with on Boy Meets World, one of them just passed away and he was younger than I was. So you get to that point, you go like, okay, you know, I'm not afraid of that. But what is it I really want to still do? You know, when I was interviewing my dad, the last time I interviewed him, I had always I interviewed him eight times for the movie. And I said, I kept this question for him. And I, and I waited for the last one. And I finally said to my dad, he's on film. I have him. It's not in the movie, though. Too long a take. And I said, Dad, you know, you've done all this stuff in your life, but is there anything you wish you'd written that you hadn't written or done that you hadn't done? He looked off camera and it really for like two minutes. And my cameraman's like tapping me like, do you think he didn't hear you? Or, and then my dad looks back and he goes, no, nope, done it. And I've said it. And I went, that's the goal in life. You know, you got to get there where you don't feel like you didn't try. You only, my dad used to say to me, you only fail when you stop trying. And which is that cliche, but I, it really is true. So to embarrassing lengths sometimes kind of gone just because I believed in something or someone. And I still do. So now I'm doing a couple of things with people I really love, a couple of ideas that I really want to take whatever wisdom I've gotten and kind of turn back and give back. I've done that through my career a bit, but really some cool life lessons and give a forum for other writers and, and actors and directors and composers and whatever I, that I know to have that forum to express themselves at this point in their lives too. That's where I'm kind of going now. There. Very cool. Other awesome stuff you've done besides... Music. You mentioned Boy Meets World. You were there a long time. You produced 66 episodes. You wrote 14 episodes. I was there longer. I was there for about 100 episodes. But then the credits all get weird. It's, yeah, IMDb. Uh, it was I, I, you were there forever. Boy Meets World. Jeff Sherman made a, invented Boy Meets World. <laughs> no, he did. I'm just, I'm just making stuff up. No, I did not he invent did. it. That was one of the first. I was an original writer on the show. I wrote the first episode after the pilot, the one with the squirt guns and painting the fence that people know the show. And then I wrote the first season. I only got two episodes the first season because I was the lowest man on the on the writing staff totem pole. But the second one I wrote was The Fugitive, which kind of boosted the Sean character, kind of turned the show in a direction I wanted to do. The reason I did it partly was the first year of the show, it's kind of interesting. We, we shot at Disney Studios on stage two, which was the big stage there. Well, I grew up on that studio a lot. And stage two, when I was a kid, was Cherry Tree Lane. That's where in Mary Poppins, where the Banks house was. So we're shooting on that stage. 
And I'm, my office is right underneath where my dad's office was in the animation building. And I just feel so whatever. But to me, television didn't seem as interesting. I'd been a screenwriter. I'd done a couple of movies prior to that. And I was like, okay, I'll do this. I need, I have kids and I got to get a paycheck. And I didn't really care that much. And then after my first episode aired, we were a top 10 show. And Michael Jacobs, our executive producer, walked up to me. He's reading the Nielsen's and he goes, you know, Jeff, you, did you see the Nielsen's? I said, I don't know what that's all about. He goes, well, last night we were a top 10 show. And I said, that's great. He goes, you don't seem excited. And I said, well, I, that's great. No, that's fantastic, Michael. And he goes, do you realize that last night or last Friday night, more people watched your episode of Boy Meets World than have ever seen a Shakespeare play? And he added me on the shoulder and walked down the hall. Now, I think that's, that's BS. I don't think that's true. But it was it really made me think. And that combined with working on the stage where my dad had done his greatest work and the on the lot where I used to walk around with Walt Disney. And I'm here in this place. And I went, I want to say something important here. So I made it a point that every year I had they called me special Jeff on the staff, but I would do that that important episode. There, there were other ones too, but I would I would always sort of stand up to do one about child abuse or running away from home or school vandalism or my final year, I just insisted that I wanted to get Eric, the brother, in college. And I had a lot of, not, hardly anybody in the writer's room had finished college or gone to college. And there was going, you don't need college. And I said, well, I don't think being the number one kid show on the air, that we should be telling kids that they shouldn't go to college. We're working against what they should be doing. So I won my battle and I got Eric into college. So there were those kind of victories for me where I kind of felt I was pushing that envelope. But uh, I, I loved working on that show. It was one of the best things I did. And I love the people on it. Still do. I still see most of them. That's awesome. Well, two things. One, I was going to ask you if you tried to get William Daniels to talk like Kit. That was one. <laughs> yes. But I'll assume no. And then, uh, and then you kind of glossed over hanging out with Walt Disney. <laughs> and it just. Oh yeah. Well, the Bill Daniels thing. The funniest thing with Bill was, of course, who hasn't seen The Graduate? Who hasn't seen Two for the Road? Who has all the great movies of Parallax? I, I go on and on. I mean, this. St. Elsewhere, my God, I watched every episode on those when it was on. And so here he is on our on our little kid show, and I'm like, oh my God. And I became really friendly with him and his wife, Bonnie. There was a year where I, I wanted to do, I said, I've never really written, I've written some good scenes for a Bill, but I want to write a good monologue for him. So I write this monologue for Bill in the school vandalism when we almost quit, Mr. Feeney almost quits because his house is vandalized and the school is vandalized. So I write him this thing and go to the table, read, and you know, you sit around and everybody's having breakfast, networks there and studios there. So Bill's reading and Bill, I, I don't know if he even looked at the script before the table read and he gets to his monologue and he reads and it's beautiful and everybody's so moved. It's a really moving thing about what it is to be a teacher and you put yourself out there and every year you re-examine yourself and it's this long, like page long thing, right? So I think he's going to just love me, right? And we're walking out of the table read and he goes, Sherman? Too damn many words. <laughs> <laughs> and went, oh my God. So he cut it down a little bit. So it's still there in, in, a, in the shape of it, but he made it Bill Daniels. He's like, I don't want to sit there and do it to be or not to be. I want to be part of the show. And it was a great lesson for me, you know, just make it work for the show and you'll make it work great. So he was wonderful. The Disney stories, I have several. Uh, the one that everybody seems to like is, um, so I met him about five times and I'd been up to his office and you know, the coolest thing I thought was that he had Disneyland. I thought he was, that's my dad works for the guy. And whenever dad and, dad and uncle Dick wrote, starting with the, the Tiki Room, they started writing a lot of the Disney ride songs. So we would go down there first and go on them. So I was on, you know, when Small World opened at Disneyland after the World's Fair, we were on the first boat, I think, or something. So we got to do all that. But this guy had his name on Disneyland and on the studio. And this, I knew he was a big shot. He was my dad's boss. So anyway, I was dying to see the sets Everybody thinks Mary Poppins was shot in England, but it was shot at the Burbank Studios, the Disney Burbank Studios on all the soundstage. And like every soundstage, you go in one, it was the the tea party on the ceiling. I got, got to watch them shoot a little of that when they had them kids on the wires and stuff, and I gave that away. But I got to watch some of the stuff that, as I said, Cherry Tree Lane was on stage two where we shot Boy Meets World, et cetera. I said, Dad, I really want you to show me this because he'd read me the stories and I really wanted to see what they were doing. So he took me out of school one day, took me around from all the sound stages and showed me. I saw the merry-go-round horses against a yellow screen that become those things in Jolly Holiday and just all the different kind of stuff. And, and I'm like, huh, okay, it's, you know, it's just a lot of walking and a lot of people hammering and dust. What I can't wait for is because they have the best tuna sandwiches at the commissary. 
uh, in the coral room, which was the executive dining room. So I can't wait to have my tuna sandwich. And we go in and Walt Disney walks in at the same time with these two guys in suits. And he, he looks and he knew me because he met me a few times. And he had a real amazing memory for people's names and their kids' names. So he gets down kind of near me. He goes, so Jeffrey, I understand you took a look at the sets for Mary Poppins today. What do you think? And I'm holding my dad's hand. And I said, no, oh, they're okay, I guess. And my dad's hand goes limp. And I look up like, I don't know what I've done. Disney looks upset and everybody's kind of quiet. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know. He goes, you come with me. And he took my hand and walked me out of the commissary back over to one of the sound stages where they had the rooftops of London for step in time. And he told the guys to stop working on it. And he turned the work lights just right. And he said, okay, so what's wrong with it? And I said, no one's going to believe it. And he said, he said, I've had the greatest art. I mean, it just, he was so exasperated with me. I was a little kid. He goes, I had the greatest artist actually go up there and take pictures, and this is all authentic. I said, I know, but it's supposed to be the rooftops, and it's sitting on the ground. And he starts laughing, and I feel like horrible. And I think I'm never getting invited to Disneyland again, and Dad's going to get fired. I think the whole thing that just ruined everything for my family. We're going to have to move back to the valley. So he comes down next to me. He does the frame like a camera frame. He goes, no, you don't understand. See, this is all that people are going to see. That's, you know, the camera lens just sees this. They won't know it's on the ground. They'll think it's on the roof. We'll make it look that way. And that's called movie magic. And you can never tell your friends. I nodded. He takes my hand. He walks me back to the commissary. And there was a writer's table where all the big Disney writers would sit. My dad and uncle were there. And they're, my dad's drinking this big scotch. I remember, I'm just thinking, like, he drinks at work. And then uh, Disney comes and whispers to my dad. And my dad probably goes back in his face. He starts laughing. He tells, everybody starts laughing. And it turns out that, you know, he told them what happened. And I didn't give a damn because I got my tuna sandwich. I almost got my dad fired that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. It's a testament to him because this is a guy who had everything. And he cared what a little, you know, whatever I was, five-year-old kid thought of his work. You know, and that's the magic. If you care about it and you make it for people, the real reward is connecting with other people. And that's what he was so good at. And that taught me something too. That's amazing. How, how was the pilot that you wrote for Turner and Hooch with uh, Biff, Tom Wilson? Yeah, a good friend of mine. He was one of my agents for a long time. And then he went off and foolishly wrote Beverly Hills Cop and became one of the biggest writers and directors in Hollywood, Dan Petrie Jr. Dan had a deal at Disney and he had done Turner and Hooch the movie. And his brother, Donald Petrie, who went on to do like Mystic Pizza and a thousand other things, was directing the pilot. We were all friends. We all played poker together. And Dan said, look, we had this writer on it, but it's, it's bad. The script's bad. And we're, we're going to shoot in about a week. Can you come on the set and just kind of rewrite this? So I said, yeah. What I didn't know was the Hooch Dog, if you remember the Hooch Dog, we're sh shooting in the middle of August. It's really hot. Hooch is this big, fat, hairy heavy, I don't know what they're called, but they would get exhausted. They'd come out in the heat and fall asleep in 10 minutes. So they had four of them. So part of my job in rewriting on the set while we were going was to cut stuff out. The script would say, Hooch picks up the newspaper, runs to the car, jumps in, licks the guy's face. He goes, just have him jump in the car. So it was like, <laughs> he can't, that's all he's going to do. And then we got to put him back in the refrigerator because he's got to cool off. So it was doing kind of that. And whereas... I love Tom Wilson. He was, he was really a nice guy and he was wonderful, but he looked like he was going to kill Hooch. He looked like he could actually, he was Biff. I mean, he was that tough guy kind of thing. Whereas Tom Hanks looked like Hooch, you know, he was going to be a soft guy. So it just never kind of kind of came together, I guess. I don't know. But it was it was fun to do because I got to do it with Don and, and Dan. I think later they tried, they did, at least for a short time, they brought that, brought that idea. Back. You know, they, I, they did it, yeah, for streaming or something. I saw somebody did it. Let's finish with the comedy special you did for Wendy. And then it's sort of a plug for Wendy too. Taller on TV, which you produced with John Landis. Yeah. So Wendy, for her 50th birthday, said to me, I said, what do you want to do for your 50th? You want to go to Hawaii? She says, well, you know, I've done half hour special for HBO and I've done this. I've been on a million things, but I've never done an hour special. I said, so? She goes, can we do that? And I said, oh. I said, you sure you don't want to go to Hawaii? Because I love producing, but there was, a, and she wanted me to direct it. And I said, I can direct, but I'm not doing a live show. And I was friendly with John because John and I actually met in the making of uh, The Boys. He was one of the people I first interviewed with Greg. 
and we, we remained good friends. And we were at lunch and he asked me what I was doing. I said, my wife wants me to direct this thing. And he goes, oh, and he hadn't met Wendy yet. So he said, well, set up another lunch. Let's let's sit with Wendy. I'd like to meet her. And so I sat with her. And by the end of the lunch, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll help you with it. Fantastic. So we kind of figured out a way. We couldn't really afford John as a director. So we had Wendy direct it, but she had it all in her head. I mean, this is all her material. And she put in a lot of her prose writing, too, and her philosophy. She's very, she's kind of known as the queen of the one-liner and then the after joke. Mm -hmm. But she really is a deep thinker. And a, I mean, she, you know, she runs very deep. And uh, so she got to get that across in the special. So we make the special and we just did it. I did it with my company at the time, Traveling Light Productions. We did it on a shoestring. We had a, one investor, Andy, who became one of our uh, partners in the business. And uh, he put up like $30,000 and I called in every favor I could. We shot it, cut it. John called in his longtime producing and editing partner, George Folsey, who I hadn't worked with since, I believe, coming to America. And we all worked in a garage. So it was very down and dirty, but we did this thing and we worked in his George's friend Brad's garage and we cut this thing together and we hadn't sold it yet. We wanted to make it and then sell it. So we go out, we had tried to get people, but they said everybody's making them and then selling them to us. So we go into Showtime and John says, let me come with you. I'll come and we'll show it together. And we walk into this guy at Showtime and the guy almost, he's one of the top executives there. He's passed away since, so really nice guy. He almost passes out because he's weak in the knees because John's there. And he said, you don't know how excited I am that John Landis is standing in my office. And he goes, and he looks at me and he goes, and I've always wanted to sleep with Wendy Liebman and you're married to her. What a great day this is for me. And John goes, I think we sold it, but I don't know if we want to go that far. <laughs> and we ended up selling it to Showtime and, and then getting it distributed. And it's it's a wonderful kind of a time capsule of Wendy at 50 and, and the, all of her work. And it's it's her. And we have a couple surprises in the special, which were really fun to do. Her parents both have little cameos, and I won't ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it. But I know you can like rent it on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. And there's some places it streams, but it's called Taller on TV. It was originally called Playmate of the Year because Wendy has a joke that she was voted Playmate of the Year in nursery school. Mm -hmm. But um, we got a call from Playboy Enterprises telling us that they would sue us if we used the Playmate of the Year because that was their property. So we changed it to Tolerante. Nice. Uh, in, I live in a world where word got Playboy. <laughs> you can't believe how fast things are. If you shoot in Los Angeles, everybody knows whatever you do. That's all I'm going to say. That's really funny. If you try to shoot without a permit, they'll know, and they're there before you start rolling. So you just my advice is shoot out of L.A. or get permitted. That's what I can tell you. Great advice and great stories. Thank you so much, Jeff, for hanging with me. This was so great. Uh, my pleasure. It's nice talking to you. And uh, and again, Wendy says hi and sends her love to everybody. Jeffrey C. Sherman, thank you so much. And give Wendy thank you. my best as well. You bet. Take care. All right. That was Jeff Sherman. How amazing was that? So many great stories. He hung out with Walt Disney. You have to watch his documentary, The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story. It's on Disney+. Plus. So worth watching. It's amazing to watch the backstory and get the full feel of the family and everything that was going on behind these amazing songs that I'm sure there's so many that mean so much to you. So definitely check that out. And definitely check out Jeff's albums. They're all on Spotify. You can stream them there. Check out Wendy's comedy special. Links in the show notes to all that good stuff. All right. Well, with the interview over, can't believe it. How did these episodes fly by so fast? Huge thank you to my guest, Jeffrey Sherman. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.